Um, I wasn't really sure what realizations of new quilt equipment meant, so I kind of put something together uh, as a statement of realization. Um, most of most of what I'm going to talk about is based on the fact that you're, I'm the guy you see on the rock pile uh, fixing a bulldozer or underneath a grader on, beside the highway or uh, crawling inside the belly of a unit to try and make it run. So I have a great deal of experience with shit that just doesn't work. <laughs> and because I have that experience, uh, I moved out of the testing, uh, assembly, and service management within our company to work with uh, younger engineers that have really no application experience but wonderful educations that uh, can go looking for information but get led astray fairly quickly. Um, so, uh, statement of realization, NMV continues to evaluate past and current 1i industry applications as we learn about 1i industry filter integration and more importantly filter performance as affected by conditions such as flow rate, fluid viscosity, and type of particles we are attempting to capture. We are realizing 1i industry product selection is in many ways the same as selecting conventional filtration. Um, Roger never likes me to use conventional filtration in the same breath as uh, magnetic filtration. But the fact is, um, you're doing very much the same thing with magnetic filtration as you are with depth meter filtration. Uh, in a lot of cases, you're just doing it better with magnetic filtration. However, if you, if you buy the wrong filter, put it in the circuit, and expect the performance that you're hoping for, you're just not going to get it. We are realizing we can make 1i industry filtration more effective by providing better information to 1i industry, to the 1i industry design team. Uh, I see a lot of 1i industry products out there now. Um, that's a great thing, but I also see a lot of 1i industry filtration out there that I don't think is as good as it could be. And after having talked to Rob Alby and Roger, I realized that some of this stuff that was selected was selected without them being made fully aware of what the intention of the product was. Um, NOV is realizing poor selection on our part. Poor selections on our part have led to and will lead to needless arguments about performance. You want to uh, see what it's like? Get Roger, Bernie, uh, Rob McQuinn, me, and some other guys into a room, and you'll, you'll get some pretty spirited debates about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the reality is uh, the results are the final arbiter. If uh, you're getting the results you want, it doesn't really matter what Roger or me or Rob LB or Rod, uh, Rob McQuinn thinks. It's how does it perform? Um, as a re result of one industry products in combination with feedback from our customer, NOV, NOV is realizing we have fluid control systems with faults and are striving to address these shortcomings. I don't see Dale Constantine here. He's one of our primary customers, but he can probably talk your ear off about all the, well, and Dave, Dave Osman, can talk your ear off about all the things they found with our systems. And the fact is, is nobody's perfect in the design. Uh, and that's not a tragedy. The tragedy is not addressing a problem when you come across it. Um, so we have a pretty wide-ranging group of products um, that span pretty much our complete, uh, our complete line. Uh, NOV was probably the first company in the world to stick uh, one eye industry magnet in uh, in liquid nitrogen, and because it's uh, so cold, it works really well. Um, the problem with liquid nitrogen products is um, they tend to break quickly, so we're not able to really demonstrate an improvement. But what I point out to customers is if you've got all this metal debris going through 10,000 to 15,000 psi pumping elements, it's probably not a good thing. And because liquid nitrogen is a cryogenic fluid, um, and uh, condensation within that circuit 
is a big issue in ice crystals, plug off conventional filtration. Magnetic filtration does what no other type of filter product can do, which is effectively filter liquid nitrogen. Um, static and circulating gearbox or gear lubricants, 68 to 460 centistoke viscosities. Um, so in static systems, we use uh, magnetic plugs um, or magnetic rods, depending on how much room we have. Um, and on circulating gear lubricants, that's where we're seeing probably the most obvious benefit to our equipment. Uh, gear lubricants are notoriously hard to lubricate uh, because they're viscous and conventional filtration uh, is too restrictive, so you have to have massive filters in order to do the job. So are you talking open gears when you're saying gear lubricants? Yeah, gear, so transmissions or uh, a gearbox like um, that you would, a speed reducer you'd put on, say a wind turbine, we don't do that, but in our world it, it's speed reducers for, to slow down or speed up gearbox or end devices like reciprocating pumps or centrifugal pumps. Um, engine oil, uh, diesel fuel, uh, and that would be diesel fired N2 heaters. So we build uh, units that uh, take cryogenic nitrogen, warm it up to 20 degrees Celsius, and they can use it for wellhead processes. Um, engines uh, and heaters such as Wabasso's and ProEat systems, the black filter that uh, Rob McQuinn had, that would be um, a good application for it. Or for these low flow circuits would be a good application for that type of filtration. Um, on, on that one, uh, we've noticed a reduction in the failure rate of the high pressure nozzles that they use to atomize the fuel in those heaters. Uh, it's probably going to take another year to really uh, come or for that for us to gather enough information from customers to know just how effective that is. But the single biggest failure on a Wabasso or Pro Heat Heater is the nozzles. They, they tend to foul. Uh, and they foul because there's all kinds of debris, uh, no matter how fine that goes into them. And then they just quit opening. So the, the Wabasto won't fire anymore. Engine and process coolant systems. Um, so uh, engine, engines uh, or engine coolant's a really big deal these days. Everybody that's applying magnetic filtration is capturing all sorts of semi-magnetic stuff and magnetic stuff, uh, all the way from brand new to uh, aged engines. Um, and uh, that, that one's a no-brainer. Uh, the stuff that tends to collect in coolant changes its pH level because uh, it allows or encourages chemical reaction. Um, and for processed coolants, where we're not uh, heat stressing the coolant as much. Um, the, pump, the pumps that we use to pump the coolant create a lot of debris. And really, there was no good way to capture it. Uh, a lot of it's submicron. So the stainless steel mesh filters that are typically available on the unit are too coarse to really do a good job. So a brief history. NOV Hydrorig Canada reactively installed our first 1i Industries product in 2009 to a unit in China where after 20 years of failures, this is a really old unit, and poor conventional filtration, per, filtration protection was required for new hydraulic pumps, motors, and valving. We got sucked into a very bad deal. We wanted to sell Chang Cheng oil field new, uh, new nitrogen pumps and coil tubing units and they said, if you want this work, you have to rebuild this old piece of crap first. So we took it on without really understanding what we're getting into. Um, we installed new pumps, motors, and valving. I started the unit up, and after 20 minutes, it quit running, and I turned over the conventional uh, filters, and a bunch of chiclets fell out. And I went, what am I going to do now? So I came back to Canada, uh, addressed some of the hydraulic uh, design uh, specifications with the engineering group, but then I had to come up with a way to do this startup and make this thing pump again. Um, so, and there's a, if I'd have been organized, I would have got together with Kim and pulled up the case study that we have for this. Um, 
So my introduction to magnetic filtration and therefore NOV's introduction to magnetic filtration um, was reactive and it was remediation uh, so it wasn't proactive um, and because I knew something about magnetic filtration as a mechanic I was skeptical um, just like almost everybody that first sees magnetic filtration as uh, but it's a different one I industries is a different technology you're probably going to hear that a lot it's true it is a different technology it's way more effective than uh, the ceramic plugs and maybe ceramic donuts you've seen in, in other systems. At age 28, this unit is still in service with no further major component failures. Uh, I don't speak Chinese, so I'm relying on other people that do to tell me or to poke these guys and ask them if they're still running it. As far as I know, it's still running. Uh, it wouldn't be running if there wasn't magnetic filtration in that system. Or it would have cost us a lot more money to remediate the, the circuit. By 2011, it became clear that one eye, pro one eye Industries products add value but are expensive. And you've heard this from Rob McQuinn, who just made his presentation. In 2011, a large segment of our customer base remained resistant to mag filtration because of cost. The reality is, most of the inroads One Eye Industries have made into our industry has been because uh, customers are willing to take the leap of faith, try some products, and see how well they worked. Um, it was very much the same way I approached it. But uh, in that time frame, 2009 to 2011, I gave Roger names uh, of companies and contacts I had and said, if you really want your product to take off, you have to go to the end user. Rob McQuinn is not telling you a lie. Uh, what our OEM manufacturers have a one-year uh, one time frame, and that's all they really care about and I belong to that group of people. If you can get your equipment to go out and last a year, your warranty, you're absolved of all warranty costs. Um, and that's where people like Bernie step in and uh, look out for uh, customers' interests and give them advice on how well a system is built and how long it, it's going to survive and what they might be able to do to get a bird bang for the buck out of, uh, out of a uh, an OEM they're considering using. If one eye industry filtration is added without much thought, two problems are created, and this this is uh, for us as an OEM. Uh, they require more time to install, driving assembly costs upwards, and they're not as effective as they can be. From 2011 onwards, emphasis has been placed on proper mag fil filter selection and placement in circuits early in unit development. In 2012, NOV purchased Enerflow uh, because of customer awareness. Some of Enerflow's products had customers selected one on one industry products already. In 2011 or 2013, NOV began integrating more one industry products onto the Enerflow product line. Um, and one of the biggest consumers uh, are the green guys on this poster here, Pioneer. Uh, they have a huge amount of of uh, one industry products already on their fleets. They're always looking for a better way to do it. Um, so I make suggestions and hope that, that they'll listen. Uh, but generally, they come to their own conclusions and say what they want to use. Um, in many cases, filtration is now installed as part of a larger assembly and placed onto the unit as the unit progresses through assembly. Uh, this is it's called uh, vertical integration in our world. Uh, you want to select everything you have uh, before you start the build, and you want to build uh, large chunks and stick it on the unit to save time. Um, so that's really where our focus is, uh, trying to get the one-eye industry stuff picked so that it can be installed as a part of a larger assembly. Uh, to help customers identify mag Filtration NOV has adopted a lightly shaded M over an ISO filter image. Uh, that was largely instigated by uh, Dale Constantine asking for better identification of mag magnetic filtration products on his equipment. Um, we had to do it anyways because it was becoming confusing even for our own staff to know what they were installing and where it needed to go. Um, I'll show you an image of that a little bit later. I'm hoping 
uh, that we can encourage other OEMs to adopt that same uh, image uh, so that there's some kind of standardization out there in the industry. Um, one industry is an NOV joint uh, designs. If you can buy it, then buy it. If you can't buy it, or buy what you need, then design it. So uh, because we build some unusual equipment, I live and die by that statement. Uh, if I need something uh, on a unit and I can't buy it commercially, then it has to be designed. And if you don't go through that step and you avoid installing something that's required, it just leads to problems further down the road. Most of the time, it doesn't impact us in the one-year warranty period, but I don't really view things the same way the, the corporate entity I view the same issues does. Uh, I have other motivations like uh, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to fix something that was avoidable. I don't want to do that anymore. And no one believes mechanics, not even Roger. That's a true statement. I can go to any facility where there's maintenance staff and operations staff and mechanics are a necessary evil. They're not a money generator. They're just the people that soak up money that uh, should be going into investors' pockets. It's the reality. Um, in the coal mines, they say, we're here to mine coal, not fix dump trucks. And in gold, mi gold mines, we're not here to fix scoop tramps. We're here to get gold out of the ground. Okay, well. Um, it's a pretty narrow view, but operations people have that view. That's the reality. Uh, if they could uh, build an indestructible piece of equipment and not have any mechanics, that's what they do. Um, last statement is somewhat true, but one industry's customers in Alberta put a considerable effort into Roger's education. I know Bernie has, Rob McQuinn has, I have. Anybody that uh, is an end user of any product that we build, um, has an opinion about why the stuff breaks prematurely and what we might be able to do to mitigate that failure. Um, so I have uh, listed three examples of uh, products that Roger uh, and I worked on with Rob Alvey. Um, and this is mostly an illustration to let you guys know as customers, you can come to one industries and they can, com they can help you with that first statement. If you can buy it, buy it. If you can't and you need it, then design it. They're good at that. They can take a concept with enough information if you can give it to them and they can build you exactly what you need to do exactly what it's intended to do. Um, one Eye Industries has, a cryogen has cryogenic filters. They're essentially Y strainers uh, that can be taken apart and serviced while the housing are at, housings are at temperatures well below minus 50. Almost any screw conduction, when you get it down past minus 100, doesn't matter how good the standard of thread is, it, you just can't get it apart. Um, and since I work on a lot of nitrogen products, we've spent a lot of time trying to develop products that are user friendly. And, and that's the name of the game. If it's not user-friendly, the mechanics are not going to maintain it. They're actually going to lie about having done a process you've asked them to complete. Um, Cross-contamination is common in hydraulic systems because case oil from failed motors and pumps enters the tank and is drawn out by other pumps because what industry products can filter at very low back pressure, the introduction of the Ad 9000 MIT line ensures case Filtration is possible with no risk to back pressure damage to components. Um, Rob McQuinn touched on this briefly, and I have an opinion about your question. The reality is a perfectly designed hydraulic system will never fail as long as you maintain the filters, as long as you re use the right kind of oil, um, and as long as uh, you're prepared to take stuff off and do periodic uh, component repairs. The, the four most common Failure points on mobile equipment hydraulics in Alberta are water contamination, solid contamination, overspeeding equipment, and improperly selected oil. If, if the circuit's properly filtered and the speed's correct and the oil viscosity's correct, in theory, the uh, components that 
you have in that circuit should go for five years or about uh, 6,000 hours of operating time, at which point um, you've saved a bunch of money and you should be willing to take it apart. Send the stuff uh, off to CBVL so Jamie can sell you a rebuild. And the rebuild cost should be nominal. If I'll give you an example. Rexroth Canada, for the most part, the rebuild tickets they send out say non-repairable. So they've made it the distance, but they're junk by the end of it. So we're almost there with, in terms of oil cleanliness and the correct type of oil, but the wear is too significant to allow that 8,000 pump to be rebuilt economically. So this is where uh, I'm headed personally, is trying to figure out what we can do to clean the systems up just a bit more so that they can make it to five years. It's embarrassing to say, but we do have component failures in under a year, and there's a guy sitting at the table smiling at me. He knows that. Um, so um, one of industries has just rolled out an ad 9000, 8000 series filter for low flow, high vis gear lubes and high flow light vis fluids such as diesel fuels. That's that big guy over there. Um, I'm, I wanted that product because uh, I deal a lot with uh, high pressure reciprocating pumps for fracturing units. And I don't feel that the oil is being filtered adequately now. Uh, oil sampling proves that. Uh, and just the sheer, the sheer viscosity of the oil and the operating temperatures that we expect it to run at, I, I think there's room for improvement. Um, I don't see Jeremy here anymore. Jeremy was kind of instrumental in helping Rob Elby and I get that pushed along. He's a Schroeder rep that, um, that recognized there was potential for a product like that. Um, because frack fleets consume a, a ton of fuel. Each one of these, there could be this many pumps on a spread. Each one of those uh, pumps has a 2,500 horsepower engine that consumes approximately uh, six gallons uh, of fuel a minute at high horsepower. Uh, in order to maintain the fluid cleanliness that uh, engine manufacturers are expecting these days with tier four high pressure injection systems, you need a massive filtration system to pre-filter the fuel before it hits the fuel filters on the equipment. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to touch on is uh, the proof that it works to me statement that it's commonly held when discussions like this happen. Oil cleanliness mag filtration opportunities for NOV to draw samples for oil analysis are rare. Customers that maintain records of oil analysis are generally reluctant to share the data they collect. Most of the time it's because somebody that's putting a lot of time and effort into installing mag filtration wants a leg up on the lazier competition that's out there and the cheaper competition that doesn't want to install it. So they don't really it's not in their best interest to tell you your shit's working because they don't want you to tell their competitors it's working. Um, often they only do so when a report shows high particles and they're asking for potential reasons and or assistance. Um, I have to be careful here. <laughs> the truth is, is almost all of the OEMs in the Alberta uh, patch, oil patch, um, they, they don't always offer uh, assistance in a timely fashion. So the end users uh, often develop this attitude that there's no point uh, in phoning NOV because they're just not going to help us. Um, we've tried to change that image, and we do want our customer base to come to us and tell us if, if they're having problems so that A, we can fix the problem, and B, if a design change is required, we can make note of it so the next generation we build uh, we design that flaw out, that flower fault out. Um, there's been probably 10 situations in the last two years where uh, we did some work, stole an oil sample off a unit, and then got it analyzed and told the customer, you got something serious going on. You need to bring the unit back to us. But the problem is, in this current operating env environment with low oil prices, it's very, very hard for these guys to pull the stuff out of the field and get it to us so that we can identify what the source of contamination is. And in almost every case where our assistance was declined, there was a serious failure 
at a time when the customer couldn't afford it to happen. It's not an infrequent thing. Uh, the customer bears some responsibility there, but so does NOV. I can't speak for our competitors, but I'm here to tell you that we don't always do everything we can, but we try, and we try harder than we used to. Um, NOV has seen a reduction in reported failures where premature failures have occurred often. Evaluation of existing mag filtration has helped. Um, the good thing about mag filtration is that um, uh, the particles that stick to the mag filters can be tested. Um, a large company called Test Oil has what they call a filter element evaluation. So what they do is remove contamination from the filter and they analyze that the the stuff that's actually uh, trapped by the mag filter. And it's far easier to do that with uh, one industry's product. It, it's not um, the same kind of oil analysis that you do by sending an oil sample. The technology is a bit different. Um, I, I believe that uh, Dale Constantine uh, is going to present the advantages of testing uh, particulate on mag filters as opposed to oil sampling. Uh, I hope to attend that because I want to learn a bit about it. Um, I do have some images so you can see uh, what we build to get some frame of reference. Which icon was it again, Kim? Oh, it's this one right here, right? So um, this is an example of a unit that uh, has a fairly comprehensive mag filtration package. Um, uh, we're doing nitrogen, processed glycol, lube oil, and hydraulic. Um, I have to say the industry is pretty resistant to chassis uh, engine filtration. Uh, an engine glycol filtration, but that's changing slowly. Um, but everything we control, uh, we're trying to get magnetic filtration in there. Uh, this is a relatively new unit. Um, it's a very large coil tubing unit that's going down into the US. Um, that's got our most advanced, or excuse me, advanced uh, mag filtration package on for coil. Um, it's specifically designed for our system, um, our system of hydraulics. Uh, there's more uh, equipment that we want, or more things we want to filter on, on that product line. Um, and as we learn about the things that uh, piss our customers off, uh, we're inclined to uh, accelerate what we're adding. Uh, gearbox for pump drive filtration. That's, that's a real sore point with most uh, consumers. Uh, so we're focusing on that. Uh, some of the newer products lend themselves really well to that type of filtration. Um, and we don't like to reinvent the wheel, so we're doing that in conjunction with CVVL. They've already um, blazed the trail, so to speak, in that respect. So we're, we're I, I talked to Jamie's boss, and, and he gave us permission to use the same craft they're using. Uh, just so it's consistent um, from us to at least one other distributor. Um, we took these pictures because this is probably, or that coil tubing unit was the first time we ever built a coil tubing unit in less than seven months. It was a big project. The customer needed it badly. <laughs> uh, that's why everybody's standing on it. Um, this is a large N2 unit does the same thing as the truck mount that was in an earlier image. Uh, that was the, our first attempt at uh, wholesale mag filtration on an N2 unit. Um, we progressed since then and added even more mag filtration to units like that. Uh, we just recently comp completed retrofits uh, for step. Uh, Dave Osman was in charge of that from the step end. Um, and that was a big undertaking because it's so much harder to retrofit than it is to do it from scratch. Uh, this is one of step units. 
that's a single engine version of the double engine unit that was just up. Um, that guy does uh, a little bit more rate. It's just laid out a little differently, um, but essentially it's the same thing. Um, and the last one was a schematic. So on this system, uh, there's two magnetic filters. Um, this is a conventional scrubber, uh, and that's how we symbolize them now. Um, we put the M in the center, and it's just an ISO symbol. It's a really easy way for guys to uh, sift through our schematics and, and identify what, what, mag, what uh, filters are magnetic. Uh, this one here is actually a magnetic filter, and I didn't review this before I brought it. This was a jointly produced, uh, a joint production effort between uh, One Eye Industries and Schroeder. Um, I went to Schroeder looking for inside out flows so that I could uh, pre filter the oil with magnetic filtration and then have a final capture with a 10 micron element. Um, and that's the nature of the beast. Uh, you have to go out and you have to find solutions for things you see going wrong. Um, and come up with ways to try and improve how things happen. Um, and I'm hoping that ISO will adopt that symbol sometime, but who knows. During commissioning, we can expect um, cheaper hydraulic components like cartridge valves. They're small modular devices that uh, are necessarily inexpensive, or they're, they're they were created because they're inexpensive. Um, they take up not very much room, but because they're a price point product uh, and because uh, startup fluids are generally dirtier than they are after two hours of multi-pass filtration, that would be the first thing that fails. Um, and that generally happens on two to five percent of all equipment we put onto the test then. Um, and then after uh, we release the equipment. Um, the next most common failure would probably be a hydraulic pump. Um, and that's why we add devices like this. Because if we can't perfectly clean the tank, uh, we put in magnetic filtration in front of uh, the suction on the pump. Oh, I read this drawing wrong. <laughs> there's the suction scrubber, and there's the secondary filter. There's our pump. So we put devices like this in um, to protect the pumps uh, from uh, initial contamination. Uh, in lube oil circuits, the secondary reason for the installation of this device is because this gearbox and this reciprocating pump express large amounts of steel and bronze contamination continuously. When they fail, um, the first place that that oil is going to go is out of the sump and uh, the lube oil pump, uh, this item right here, is going to try and suck it up. Um, so the secondary benefit is you know you're going to eventually have a failure and all of this stuff, these images right here, all of that stuff is restrictive and it plugs off because of debris. Uh, so on a circuit like this, um, the next most common failure is this reciprocating pump. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make it survive longer. Uh, magnetic filtration really helped. Um, and uh, the magnetic filtration we've put in the system ensures that there isn't a big repair bill to clean it up after the failure. Yep. Are you doing training with the end users people? to ensure that they understand how to clean a magnetic filter? Or, you know, because if I throw in a bag filter, they're going to know what to do with that. They may not, at the moment, know what to do with a magnetic filter for a new customer. The answer to that question is, is no. We don't typically uh, do direct training uh, with mechanics, yeah. but when supervisors that manage mechanics come in, uh, we have discussions with them. Okay. From what I've seen, most guys or most of our customer base uh, decides that uh, they should go directly to the source and they have seminars at One Eye Industries frequently on 
what they need to know about servicing one eye products. We pick up plastic, stainless steel, carbon steel. Um, yeah, we use uh, cryogenic rated plastics. Uh, we pick up some of that debris uh, because our, our nitrogen systems are, uh, they have some recirculation in them. Um, for the most part, when you have uh, new equipment, you have debris left behind in the piping in the tank. Uh, but ongoing, uh, companies like Ferris that, uh, that sell liquid nitrogen, the way that uh, liquid nitrogen is produced, they compress it to a high pressure and then they refrigerate it. And as the temperature, the compressed uh, gas cools down, they start to distill or fraction off uh, cryogenic gases as they appear in terms of uh, liquid point. So first one CO2, uh, then it's nitrogen, and then it's the rare earth, or sorry, the noble gases after that. Um, most of the ongoing debris in liquid nitrogen is generated by the compression of, of the natural gas, or sorry, of, of air. Uh, they're not getting all of it out and it gets pumped along into their storage vessels and then transferred over to uh, the tanks on our nitrogen pumps. Um, it's also true that uh, the tank's quite large and a lot of uh, turbulence is required to cause all of the debris from manufacturing the tank to migrate uh, to the suction port and eventually work its way out. But after, uh, I don't know, 14 years uh, of seeing dirty tanks, I'm pretty sure that the nitrogen providers are responsible for a lot of the contamination. Um, I've seen gophers in nitrogen valves. Um, I've seen black widow spiders and mice. Uh, I've seen um, I've seen grain. Uh, I'd say that if it's medical grade nitrogen like Praxair produces, it has to be perfectly clean. Um, Medical, they sell only medical grade nitrogen because they have to service the gas or the, the uh, hospitals and stuff. Um, they don't filter, uh, rely on just filtering the, li the cryogenic liquid. They're using, um, they're filtering vaporized gas uh, to ensure that they can get to the 99.999 criteria that uh, hospitals and the health boards are looking for. So Arthur, did the magnetic filter remove the mice and the gopher as well? <laughs> no, but you saw the pictures. There was big blobs of plastic on there, which really surprised me uh, because um, cryogenic temperatures and uh, intensify magnetic fields. Um, and there's probably uh, 10 times more static adhesion at cryogenic temperatures. We do pull out big chunks of plastic and all sorts of other things you wouldn't expect to see on magnetic filtration. So are these also food grade? Hmm? Are these filters also food grade? We have a whole food grade line, yes. Fantastic. <coughs> so do we. Hmm? So, so do we of lubricants. Perfect, yeah. Anything else? Hope you guys didn't get too bored. Nobody fell asleep. That happens sometimes when I talk.